Hello, and thank you for joining us. This is the Miro Consulting webinar on Oracle audit failures due to proprietary hosting and APIs. Uh, we're going to begin the webinar in about a minute. We're just going to give everyone a chance to log in, put their headphones on, get settled, uh, and we'll be, be beginning shortly. All right. Thank you for joining us. If you just logged in, this is the Miro Consulting webinar uh, on Oracle audit failures due to proprietary hosting and APIs. Uh, the presenter today will be Wayne Federico, Miro's COO and VP of Technical Services. Uh, I am Sean Donahue, VP of Marketing, and I will be your host for today's event. Next slide. If you have any questions, this is your opportunity to get some free consulting in. Uh, so, you know, that's why we like to make these webinars and not like a blog, long series of blog posts. We really want to get your questions. Uh, this is a great opportunity to talk to some of the uh, analysts. I got some of my best analysts in the room right now. So uh, please use that question tool uh, and we will get to you at the end of the session. All right, real quick, I just want to let you know who we are. Uh, we are the leading provider of software asset management and subscription management services for Oracle, Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, Web Services, and Salesforce. Uh, we specialize in cloud, uh, excuse me, we specialize in license management, audit advisory, negotiation tactics, support management, and cloud services. And of course, our ROI is to save you money on your software license subscription investments, stay in compliance, and we will help defend you in an audit situation. And remember the best part of working with Miro, there's no risk because we have a performance guarantee. We're the only ones in the industry that do. Uh, that is the we, the amount of your savings that you'll get on from these different vendors you have uh, from working with us and us helping you save. That's always going to be more money than we charge in our fees. So it is a win-win. Next slide. And with that, I will turn it over to Wayne to uh, explain what is proprietary hosting and APIs and how can they get you in trouble, Wayne. All right. Thanks a lot, Sean. Okay. Um, thanks for everyone showing today. Um, Basically, with over uh, 20 years of assisting clients um, navigating Oracle audits, software compliance challenges, there are a few topics that Oracle does not spend much time discussing in any of its materials. Um, and because of this, when I ask organizations about the familiarity with these topics, most, 90%, have not heard of these software compliance topics, let alone understand them. Proprietary hosting is the one that they really don't hear of. APIs, people know what an API is, but they don't necessarily know how uh, it's impacted by Oracle licensing requirements. Um, but these are topics that if implemented in a manner different than Oracle requires, could easily result in software license shortfalls that can come at a significant cost. So we're going to go through each one of these. I'm going to start with prop posting, proprietary hosting. The most important thing to understand about the definition of proprietary hosting is that it involves a custom built, whether or not you paid someone to build it or you built it yourself by your staff, uh, application solution that is being made commercially available to at least several of their, of their clients, right? Um, it's a kind of a one-to-many scenario. Um, Oracle would care about it if their software is being embedded within the solution as part of the solution. Okay. Um, now, the in the past, and even to a small degree today, we don't see it as, as much. Applications were created and then shipped to the end user organization for them to be installed on their site. Um, this was successful as it was previously negotiated as to how much the vendor was paid in royalties for the use of their software in such a solution. And the organi organizations could easily track where the custom application was shipped um, and that would trigger the, the royalty payments and so forth. So all the usage parameters and limitations were worked out prior to any client buying the software. Then the internet came along um, and custom applications no longer needed to be shipped as end users could access the software installed at the site of the application creator. Um, there were lots of advantages for an organization to set up uh, their, their SaaS solutions in that manner. 
But what it inadvertently did was to eliminate the ability for the vendor to know which of the custom application organization um, clients were using it. Um, they might not even know that they're using because there's no, a lot of organizations just think, oh, I build this and I give people access to it. Um, and, and that's all we need, right? Well, what further compounded the situation was that folks could install a processor license for Oracle database. And they felt that gave them the right for any person on earth to use the software because, you know, it's considered processors technically considered an unlimited type of um, use, but it really isn't. It's unlimited for employees, not for um, people outside the organization. Um, so that's not true in what people assume. And also the processor license uh, only gives an only, uh, it's only for the internal employees. Um, Whereas applications have their own, you know, if you're doing e-business or something like that, those have different um, different licensing metrics as well um, that have to be considered. Um, now, the websites make the topic a little muddy um, because it may seem that more than employees are accessing information on a website, uh, but it really depends upon the solution that's being provided. Slightly ahead of myself. Okay. Um, now, um, yes. The now, if the if the organization, because a, a good example for websites, if it's really about what's being done, if the website is just gathering information. Uh, it's pulling information from a database, just supplying it to uh, for someone to search, kind of to find out what uh, what menu items exist at a restaurant, right? Um, it's very static; it doesn't add anything to it. Um, but if you had a application that one could access, let's say you're a car manufacturer, and you want to give people the ability to run a um, to run a program that enables them to pretty much build their car online and buy it online. Well, that is a transaction that is providing value to that end user. And Oracle would definitely consider that a proprietary host solution. Um, so that's that's kind of a, an idea of understanding what the difference is. Um, it's possible for virtually any organization to benefit from building a proprietary hosting uh, host solution. So any organization could have um, such a situation in place. Some of these solutions have been in place way before prop hosting was even brought up. Now, prop hosting has been around for a while now. It's been around probably since 2011, 2012. It's, it's been a while. Um, so it's not something really recent. Uh, it's just that Oracle really doesn't talk about it very much. Um, now, to try and identify it, Oracle leaves it very kind of high level, but there's a couple of things that really can kind of uh, pinpoint. It's actually easier to explain what is not a proprietary hosting uh, solution uh, than it is to uh, say what is. Um, so off the shelf installed application, right? You buy it off the shelf. It may or may not come with its own database, right? Maybe it gives you the option of using SQL Server or database, Oracle database. But when you bring them along to use with this thing you bought off the, the shelf, then you're providing the database with the licensing that you require. So it's kind of separate, right? It's already kind of built in to the pricing of the way that off the shelf works. So that wouldn't be prop hosting. Application solution built for a single client, right? You did a custom job for somebody and it's just for this one client. Well, that's not prop hosting, right? Prop hosting is a one to many. Um, so just having a custom for a single client to cover a certain uh, solution, that doesn't count. Application built by an individual employee and is just for their use. Again, no one external is using it. It's only built by somebody internally and only employees are using it, not prop hosting. Custom built application that utilizes no Oracle software. Okay, that one seems obvious, but uh, Microsoft and IBM also have their own versions of proprietary hosting. Microsoft called it like self-hosted um, applications, um, and it's similar, right? So 
even though it's not Oracle, you could still have an issue with another vendor. Um, but for Oracle, you know, obviously it has to be utilizing Oracle software. Um, custom built application that utilizes Oracle software like database, but it's only intended for internal employees. Again, it's not uh, accessible to anyone from the outside. If that's the case, it's not prop hosting, right? So that's kind of the key aspect to those. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. How does it create a software compliance issue? So the, these issues come about when Oracle identifies something that they feel falls under the definition of proprietary hosted application. Oracle salespeople can stumble upon the potential existence of such solutions by examining an organization's website, right? They go kind of poking around your website and they look for like a login, right? Because it would be something that you would log into if you were um, a customer of theirs. Um, and then it has something that's transactional, kind of like that, you know, that car manufacturer. It's something that is, you're putting information in, you're getting a response back from it. Um, it's not static. Um, and that's how they'll, many times we've seen, they'll approach a client and say, hey, you know, we see this different stuff on your website. We feel that that's, um, you know, you've got some prop hosting running here. Um, and, and the key thing is just about the prop hosting that what really gets Oracle is that there's just no way for them to uh, charge for it. That's why they need this kind of separate thing. They want extra money to give the ability for people outside of the internal users the ability to, to use it, right? So it's just a, a different type of royalty that they would get before from ASFU or ESL type licensing. Um, Oracle automatically adds language to its contracts that indicates you cannot use the software for use with public entities. So if in your situation, your clients are actually public entities, you'd have to literally go in and, and uh, during negotiation, change that language so that it's, you know, or make sure on the PAR form that you're discussing public entities as you are. And we'll get more on the PAR form uh, into that. Um, also having a ULA does not mean it's proprietary hosting usage is covered. It is not. It is actually, it has to be very deliberately put in. And it usually has certain limitations to it when it's, when it's in a ULA, right? It's not just open like a regular ULA is to Oracle software. So with that being the case, um, that stuff has to be, be watched because if you are in a ULA and you're running a, a proprietary hosted solution and you go to certify that ULA, um, you, they're not going to give you any licenses to apply against that solution. So you'll be, you'll be out of compliance right at that um, or even during the contract since it doesn't cover it anyway. Um, and um, and if you have a ULA but you never filled out a PAR form or included language about the custom application when um, when it comes time to certify, like I said, you're not going to receive anything. Um, so it's key kind of to to understand what's being covered and when. Um, now there have been some changes in recent years. It was previously required that you run your proprietary hosted application from the data center of the organization that is selling it to the customers, right? So if if I wrote the, if I, as a, as a company, wrote an application for my clients to utilize, I'd have to host it on my site. I couldn't host it anyplace else. Oracle's lightened up on that, specifically, most specifically with OCI, because obviously they want people using their cloud, but they also opened it up to third-party data centers as well as AWS. Um, now, big difference with, OCI, you can pretty much, you're, you're already within the Oracle ecosystem. With AWS, you cannot buy your license, buy prop hosting licenses through AWS, through the RDS system, right? Um, with AWS, because they, in their um, contract with Oracle, they don't allow, uh, they're not allowed to sell people software that is used by people beyond their employees. So um, they cannot add prop hosting to those licenses. So how it would have to work is you'd have to identify, okay, I'm going to move it to AWS. I'm going to identify exactly the footprint, licensing footprint it's going to need. And then uh, if I've ha already had proprietary hosting concession licenses, 
already own them using them on premise, I can shift it for use to AWS. I just have to make sure it fits with the AWS licensing mm -hmm. rules and so forth. Um, so you can't, you can't buy through it. And what's confusing is Amazon still tries. And we've even had seen a couple of situations where they sold the client stuff that couldn't have possibly, you know, that weren't prop hosting. Um, this is really important to understand because they don't, and I had to literally get on a phone for one client with AWS. And when I was questioning the AWS guy on his contracts with Oracle, that's when the light bulb, uh, and he knew immediately what I was talking about. Um, so they just allow you to kind of take what your current BYOL you already have for prop hosting and apply it. It's just, you have to apply it the same way the licensing um, counts would have to work against an AWS environment. You can also utilize a co-location site. So if you had a third party, you want to kind of, you, you could do that as well. But again, you're, you're creating those licenses before those BYOL licenses. Um, you got to bring them with you when you're, when you're doing it that way. Okay. Nope, not there yet. Um, the, let's, I just touched on that. Okay. All right. So what we have here is a, a diagram. Try to help to indicate where things can get complicated with prop host solutions. Um, this diagram is a typical config. Uh, it's not all existing on the same server. It's broken up um, because what we do run into is people will have all pieces running on a single server. And in those situations, that's bad because what Oracle has done with people in those situations is they'll go and require people to um, double license because they want the server licensed for the prop hosting solution for external users and they want it licensed for the internal users, right? Um, because they're two separate kind of user bases and they require two separate licenses. Now, this is really the where you would want to really break it up because you'd have, let's say, the custom application on one server. Maybe you have a demo server that's a separate server. Um, and you have the development server that's, you know, kind of really on your internal network where your employees are working because they're working on, on development. Now, if the development server is not accessible via um, the end user, they can't access it, you don't have to license it for prop hosting. You would have to license um, just what they can see. So if you're actually doing demos, um, then they're accessing it. So you would need to license uh, the demo server for prop hosting and you'd have to license the prop hosting solution. And the idea would be that really only clients are pretty much hitting these. Um, only administrators from the internal are kind of managing this. Everyone else is on you know, the development server. So the big thing that we look for people to do once we identify, if they've never identified it before, is break up that uh, setup. So this way you're not gonna get stuck Oracle looking to get back support on previous use because it was all on one server and all this kind of stuff. You wanna at least have it broken up um, so that it kind of works that way uh, much more easily. Um, Everyone's understanding that the, the the special proprietary hosting licenses they're not actual like proprietary hosting licenses they're literally just regular licenses, um, but you have to buy them and they have to have a, a corresponding par form and so forth um, with it. Now we can move into how can an organization address such compliance issues. Um, Knowing exactly how each situation might be proprietary hosting can be challenging as Oracle has never really developed a method to easily determine uh, what they would consider a proprietary hosting solution. And this is because there are constant changes in technology, the interoperability of systems and solutions in the market. Um, but we've discussed in these slides today should help you identify the obvious situations where such solutions exist. At the end of the day, it's Oracle's decision whether or not a particular solution does indeed fit the definition of proprietary hosting, but this should help give you an idea of whether you are possibly in a danger zone. Um, but when you do identify this prop hosting, you will need to be filling out a PAR form. Um, 
and that that form is basically a um is essentially a form specifically for prop hosting um, situations. And it'll go in and ask questions about um, what products are used for Oracle, um, what's the audit, what, who's using it, what is the type of clients that would be using it, is it all, um, you know, is it public uh, entities, um, is it a vertical, um, how do they access it? How much control do they have over the solution? Um, and usually SaaS solutions are for limited control. Um, so they want all this information in a PAR form. And the key thing to, to a PAR form is to try and be as, and, and we're very accustomed to this, try and be as generic as possible um, uh, when laying it all out, because you want it to last for the for the whole future of this likely growing uh solution that you're providing your clients um and you when it grows you don't want it to accidentally kind of all of a sudden become something that is kind of different than what was originally described that it did that's why we like to use like suites you know things kind of like oh, this is a suite for financials and something you know be something more generic so this way it's always going to fit um and that's always a challenge but that's important to do um uh, and then occasionally, occasionally we've been able to get Oracle to apply a proprietary hosting concession um, to existing licenses, but it's typically difficult to get Oracle to approve such a change. We've done it, um, but it's because Oracle considers the proprietary hosting concession uh, to have more rights in its use uh, than a normal full use license. Um, and, the and they charge more for a license that has such a concession. Usually it's like five or 10% more um, than what the license would normally cost. Um, but that's what they would rather. So they see it as kind of a, a buying event. Um, and that's what they're going to look for. So, yeah. so anything that kind of comes across like this, you want to um, be aware that there may be additional licensing uh, implications here. And uh, it's something you'd have to deal with. Because um, ideally, you want to deal with this stuff before you're getting audited. Um, it's the better time to deal with it. Okay, moving on to the next topic, application programming interfaces. Now, I, I think most people have some familiarity with APIs. You know, essentially, they're enabling you to talk between um, different systems, right? So basically, it shares different fields that you can combine and shift data from one application to a completely different application, right? They're all over the place now. It's more in demand of use today than it's ever been before. Um, so in this diagram, what I'm trying to do here, we're assuming this is a solution for employees of an organization. However, it could also include external users, but that goes beyond what we want to try and cover in this webinar. Um, so we want to kind of go through uh, what these typically would be. So let's say you know, you got a field employee, you got an office employee, field employee works in the field, connected to the internet. You've got a custom application for the field employees, and you've got Oracle eBusiness order management running within uh, your internal network as well. Now, the concept here is when now, this diagram does not depict a proprietary hosted solution. We were just talking about that since it's only for employees. But you could have a proprietary hosted solution that utilizes APIs. But again, it gets more complicated than we want to convey today. <clears throat> so let's just say the company manages vending machines at many locations. The field employee goes out and services broken units and fills them with candy chosen by the organization that is renting the vending machines. The company developed an internal application that allows the field employees to make changes to the orders when they're going out to the sites and they're, they're maintaining the, the machines that they can change like maybe the food options that are available within the machines. So the next time a person comes out, they have new stuff to fill the machines with um, and the orders are processed through e-business order management. The field employee may have, uh, typically they'll have like a handheld tablet or some kind of device to make changes from the field to an organization's orders. Um, but the device itself doesn't 
typically require people to log in. So you're not logging into order management. You're logging into the network, but you're not logging into order management, the application. Um, uh, and once the order is put into the custom application, it itself is using an API, which will lock itself into the business order management from behind the scenes. Now there's there can be like, you know, five, 10, maybe connections between the two to facilitate, depending on how many, you know, field employees there are, and, um, you know, but it's multiplex, it is a multiplex connection. And a lot of people try and count how many people are existing, uh, how many connections exist between the order management server and the custom application, um, when that's the wrong place to count. Um, because that, like I said, might only have five or 10 connections, Oracle requires is you count at the front end. So you're really supposed to be counting the field employees. Um, that's where you're supposed to be counting. Um, so, um, and then the office employee, now this person may have, you know, they may log in, right? there Because they may work with order management all day long and that's fine, They there's a license for that. So, um, so now let's say that the custom application utilizes an Oracle database and they're using a processor metric on the custom application server here, right? In that situation, all of the field employees will have a proper, the proper licenses in order to interface with that server, right? Because it's their employees and it's processor. So it's unlimited count for employees. Um, <clears throat> but the connection made between the custom application server and the order management server is accomplished through that API. And, you know, you could have, let's just say there's like a thousand uh, field employees. Well, uh, you would require to count at the front end a thousand application user licenses for order management. Um, now, that's one thing. Now, if you had application user as a metric, um, if you decided in the process of trying to figure out, okay, how do I, you know, fix the situation? There's a couple different situations that you can you can play with. Um, you could just buy the thousand licenses. It could be cost prohibitive. So maybe somebody says, okay, that's too expensive. I can't do that. Um, yeah, well, it was often. Now, um, so in that case, what you could do is this person over here, the office employee, they do have a license. They they log into water management every day. If this process just queued all of the information that the field employees put in, but doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go into the order management unit on its own automatically. Something has to be initiated by this office employee. So if they go and click on an, uh, a process that says, okay, I'm gonna pull the data in for the day into the order management system. If they go and initiate that, then they're the one that's bringing the data in and you're covered because that person is licensed, right? And they're the one that's working with the data. Um, and that works well. Um, now, there's also businesses that that doesn't work with uh, if it's if there's some kind of a flow issue. You know, it's really not, you know, uh, you can't really wait for one point during a day. You know, we need it to be automated. You know, there, there's reasons. Uh, so another option would be to, uh, license it via um, a enterprise metric. So it could be millions of dollars of revenue. Um, so it's not by employee. So it, you're covered. Now, that could be more expensive um, than the other. It might not be. Depends upon what Oracle is really looking for in, uh, as, as kind of a settlement, but that might be an option. You know, we've definitely helped clients work into that if the other didn't make sense. Um, so there's a couple scenarios and it really depends upon how everything functions, um, but that is definitely um, how you can address it. All right. Um, and that's pretty much uh, what we've discussed. And I don't know if we've got any questions out there from anybody. Yeah, we, we, we have a few here. Um, I want to start with the most basic one. Earlier, you put in that it was the client, if a, 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 someone, a client outside of the organization, not an employee. Um, the question was, does that apply to only clients or can that apply to any non-employee? Um, it, it's normally... Uh, 
it, again, it depends on a scenario because if there are, if it's all about using this application, it could be kind of anyone, um, but this is all, uh, you know, this is all specifically about how this particular API works. Because an example with Oracle eBusiness, if you were to have external um, users of Oracle eBusiness, there are um, li specific licenses for people who are external to the company that are not employees. Uh, so, okay. I, I think anyway. it was actually referring to the, um, uh, I think it was referring to the prop hosting. Oh, the prop hosting. Yeah. Um, yeah. With the prop hosting, um, if it was a client, um, not sure how that would really, it's, it's um, like maybe a consultant or a, um, I don't know what other one, with, with Java, we talk about a lot how, uh, it, you know, you have to license, you know, not just your employees, your part-times, your, your, you know, your consultants, if they're working directly for you. I guess that question was probably just related to other people accessing uh, your via prop posting other than maybe someone who you would consider a client. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, it sounds like the answer is it kind of depends on exactly it, it so depends. And that's why I said it's easier to kind of indicate what is um is not prop hosting than it is what is prop hosting. <laughs> that's that's the challenge today. We've Got seen it. a lot, but um the, the new technology causes things to shift all the time. Okay. And I'm I'm getting a bunch, like I see a bunch of you are are, are sort of giving me um uh, descriptions of your environment uh and asking if it is considered prop hosting and, and the answer is we're, we're never going to get through it in a chat question here. Um, so I'll tell you what, everyone who is asking that, uh, that, you know, is my environment prop hosting, we will follow up with you right afterward individually. You could tell us about what your situation is uh, and we could advise you on whether we think it is or is not. I could definitely want to make sure everyone here is aware. Uh, our, our advice is completely confidential. Uh, we do not uh, talk about who you are, what the questions you were asked us. We don't go to, you know, a, uh, 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 taking your scenario anywhere outside of our organization for anyone else to review it would be remain complete with uh, with us. So we can help you. We will. We can and will help you determine if that environment is prop hosting. Uh, I'm going to give it another just a second here. If anyone has, I'm scrolling through here. Anyone has a a answer to? Uh, no, it's pretty much everyone here is is kind of all the questions left at this point are asking. Uh, more or less different versions of the same thing. So we're going to get back to you after the event. Wayne, can you flip to our next slide? Uh, and so I just want to quickly wrap it up here. Uh, if you haven't contacted us already, please just contact us at sales at miracleconsulting.com. Uh, you can reach us on phone 732-738-8511, extension 1208. Uh, and we're on the web at miracleconsulting.com, where you can also find some more blog posts and other information we've posted in the past about uh, prop hosting APIs and all of that. And finally, I just want to remind everyone in the room, if you want to work with us on something like this, we have a performance guarantee where uh, the cost of our fees will be less than the amount you save. Uh, and if you've got questions on anything other related to Oracle, such as your Java situation with all the Java licensing changes uh, or anything else, please contact us and let us know. Uh, that will be it for today. Thank you very much for attending our event. We hope you got a lot out of it. Have a great day. Thank you. <clears throat>